Good evening. Welcome. My name is Victoria Sung, and I'm Assistant Curator of Visual Arts here at the Walker Art Center. And I'm very excited to introduce today's program, organized in conjunction with the exhibition Sia Armajani, Follow This Line. And that is the premiere of Slavs and Totters' newest lecture performance titled Red Black Thread. Slavs and Totters is an internationally renowned art collective devoted to an area east of the former Berlin Wall and west of the Great Wall of China, um, more commonly known as Eurasia. Their work has been shown at institutions around the world, including MoMA, New York, Tate Modern London, SALT Istanbul, the Dallas Museum of Art, and Kunsthalle Zurich. The collective's practice takes the form of three activities, exhibitions, publications, and lecture performances, one of which we'll experience in just a few short moments. Slavs and Totters have published eight books to date, most recently Ripped Script, which meditates on the politics of alphabets and transliteration. An exhibition of their work, the largest to date, is currently on view at the Albertinum in Dresden. On the occasion of the Walker's exhibition, Sia Armajani Follow This Line, we've had the pleasure of collaborating with Slavs and Totters, both in terms of the exhibition catalog, which features their fantastic contribution, and in the galleries themselves. If you've had a chance to walk through the exhibition, you may have seen that the final room features Armajani's Sacco and Vanzetti reading room number three. And the books on view were selected by Slavs and Totters as part of their reading list for Red Black Thread. And tonight, they will unravel and weave together the various strands of their research. Before we begin, I should note that the lecture performance will be approximately 45 minutes. Um, if you have any questions afterward, please feel free to come to the stage following the program. And of course, our galleries are open until 9 PM tonight. Now, without further ado, please help me welcome Slavs and Totters, uh, Payam, to the stage. Good evening. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you to the team for inviting us this evening. Um, tonight's lecture performance is the first, uh, is a debut of a, of a new one. It's the first new one in four years. And it's the first one dealing with topics which are, I think, for the first time relevant immediately to the United States. Um, and this, normally we don't put together the questions of black identity, especially black identity as it's defined and constructed and, and, uh, in its history in the United States and the notion of Russia in the same breath. But this is something that we've been, it's, it's become a kind of modus operandi of our practice is putting things together that you normally don't put together or reading one thing through another. We call this the faculty of substitution. In fact, if you want to understand something, it's better not to go from point A to point B, but to pursue a kind of circuity or circuitousness um, and to sort of go around the subject. And it's something that we see in, uh, in Sia's work, in resonance that, uh, in Sia's work that we uh, recognize in, in understanding questions such as transcendentalism through Shia revolutionary politics, uh, American anarchism through Dewey. Um, now, this is something, as I mentioned, we've done before. We've looked at the relationship between Solidarność and Poland and Iran's revolution, the relationship between Catholicism and Shiism, both in terms of craft movements. But the, relation, the, the idea of black identity and its construction in, in Russia is something which is particularly discussed as a Cold War, um, through a Cold War perspective, and particularly through an Atlanticist perspective. And what I mean by Atlanticist is, is also a linguistic idiom of Anglophone and Francophone worlds, whether it's negritude or black internationalism. These are often, and for obvious reasons, defined through questions of the slave trade and history of the slave trade through the Atlantic and the diaspora of African Americans uh, here in the States. Now, the relationship between Russia and black identity predates communism and predates Marxism itself. In 1895, 96, Russia actually established the first hospital on Ethiopian soil on the African continent. Um, it was in the wake of the Battle of Adwa, Menelik II's battle against the Italians. This, was a, uh, this hospital treated over 30,000 people and, up and um, conducted more than 1,000 surgeries or operations most of which were done at, uh, at people's domiciles or, or homes, but some of which were done in the actual building itself. There was a certain affinity, as you can imagine, between Russia, Orthodox Russia, and Orthodox uh, Ethiopia, which is about, at the time and still today, about 55% Christian Orthodox. Now, in 1917, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution ushered in the first socialist state, and this had profound significance for a population whose lives were determined by 
the notion of exploited labor, right? Um, and this is, is important in particular because when we think of, of it's, when we think of the instrumentalization of what the Soviets called the Negro question, it's easy to, to dismiss it as a kind of Cold War proxy warfare. Uh, but it's, there was also an important understanding of what can happen when another world is possible, but that world is not a utopia. And when the third Communist International took place in 1919, in the charter was written a, a, an explicitly anti-racist, a commitment to anti-racism, to the liberation of African nations, and to the descendants of those African nations in the charter. This was the first time a white-led nation had an anti-racist platform within its very uh, charter. Now, this question of, of, of propaganda, of course, of using the, the, what the Soviets called the Negro question as a kind of propaganda tool might be, might be familiar to some. It's not only um, the Soviet Union which did this, but also it happens uh, in less likely places, for example, if we think about, again, we're sort of obsessed with these two geopolitical poles of communism and political Islam, which I'll discuss a little bit later. But um, if we look at the kind of the uncanny resemblance between the Soviet hammer and sickle and the, and the Iranian republics, the Islamic Republic of Iran's sort of seal, we also remember that during the hostage crisis of 1979, the first hostages and the only hostages which, which, who, whom were released early were women and blacks. And the reason was because Khomeini believed that the black Americans who were in Iran were serving, even in Iran, under sort of under repression, that they didn't have the full rights of white Americans. Uh, but of course, also we can look at the, uh, the small but important fact that the first nation to issue a stamp uh, in honor of Malcolm X was Iran in 1984, which is an unlikely, uh, unlikely occurrence. You would imagine that other nations would have done this earlier. Now, if we're going to talk about race, it's important the terminology we use because, especially the terminology that's not in the Anglophone idiom. In Russian, chorny, which means black, is actually reserved for not African Americans or Africans, but actually for people who look like me. Chornys are the, are the Caucasians and Central Asians, the people of the sort of Russia's southern rim, if you will, or Russia's. Um, yeah, Russia is near abroad in some sense. So, I mean, this guy kind of looks like me, actually. <laughs> but, uh, and the irony is, of course, that these are called Caucasians, right? So these are the real Caucasians, and, and that's a whole nother uh, discussion of how the word Caucasian is used in English, and especially in North America. Now, this is the, the region where the people of, of, this is really where the kind of the labor, migrant labor of Russia is from. And when I lived in Moscow, it was, that's one of the partly, one of the reasons why I felt so much at home, because all the migrant labor spoke, well, all, mo many of the migrant labor spoke a language which was familiar to me, either my mother tongue, Persian, because Tajikistan speaks Persian, which is here. Half of Uzbekistan speaks Persian. Some of Azerbaijan speaks Persian. And all the food, uh, if you want to eat um, non-white food in Russia, you're eating, for example, like here you would go to have Asian or Latin, Amer Latin, uh, Latin American food. There it would be sort of Caucasian food or Central Asian food, so food that I grew up with, in fact. Now, also, the, the other people who were historically named Chorni, or black in Russia, were actually the, the peasants, or the serfs, because they were dealing with, the, they were tilling the soil, the black soil. The black soil, Chornazyom is a term, is actually a region in the southern belt of Ukraine, which was providing, very much actually like here, was providing the majority of the grain for the world in, before the, the Bolshevik Revolution. And that's one of the disasters of the Ukrainian famine, of course, was that uh, the breadbasket of the world had sort of had been reduced to a, a place where the population starved itself. Now it leads us to, to also to the idea of Russians self-image. Because Russia is in Asia and Europe, it's considered to be sort of self and other. And if you're familiar with Edward Said's Orientalism, this is a, a one of the our sort of most recent lecture performance, which we actually did about a year ago today at the Guggenheim, is called I Utter Other, and it's all about how we can read Orientalism. Not from a French and uh, not from a sort of Western perspective, but how Russia's Orientalism, Russia's position as kind of Asian and European nation, um, challenges Said's understanding of the term. I mean, I always joke that Russians are essentially white people who act like brown people, 
which is why I like them so much, because uh, they're, they're educated in a kind of white curriculum, let's say, an Enlightenment curriculum. They've read Hegel, they've read the Greeks and Shakespeare, but the way they interact with one another, a small C, if you will, or a big C, depending how you define culture, the way they drink tea, the way they pay for the dinner bill, the way Russians embrace one another emotionally, affectively, is much closer to the Middle East, <coughs> to Asia, or, um, or Africa, in fact. Now, on this point, After of course... the Egyptian oops. and Indian, the Greek and Roman. Sorry. On this point, let's listen to W.E.B. Du Bois on the idea of double consciousness uh, that he developed in, um, in his uh, book, The Souls of Black Folk. After the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and the Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil, and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One now, an army of Russian trolls would argue opposite, but Russia's eagle sort of swings both ways. Um, because, of, because of the fact that it, it is situated in both these, in the East and in the West, but also because if you look at Russia geographically, it's important that Perm, one of the sort of ten Russian cities with a population of more than a million, is east of the, Hindu, of the Indus River. Um, Moscow is east of Jerusalem. So this idea of Russia as a Western nation is a, is a fallacy by all measures, despite what Russians themselves historically have, have, uh, have tried to define themselves, uh, especially since Peter the Great. Now the threat from Russia, and one of the reasons, sort of historically, the, to Kiev and Rus, medieval Russia, the threat always came from the steppe. Right? The Tatar hordes, the Mongol Tatar horde, the Golden Horde. Well, the question is, what is a steppe? In some sense, a steppe is a kind of middle finger to geography and geology, because it's not a forest. It's kind of a stunted forest. But it's not as ambitious as a desert, either. So it's, it's this kind of weird rolling shrub that you can see past, but it's, uh, it's neither one nor the other. But this relationship between the Tatar hordes, which is, con I mean, which is cons construed to be as conflictual, is actually much more complicated than we think. For example, the Orthodox Church always viewed the Catholic Church as more of a threat than the Muslims themselves, the, the, that were living on Russian territory. And, um, and the tribes that were living, uh, the, the Tatar tribes, in fact, in more, they were more periods of peace with the Kievan Rus than there were periods of warfare. The one thing that, unfortunately, sort of Russians in the West agree upon is the way this Tatar horde has been construed in sort of history. Because everything from sort of dysfunctioning toilets at the Sochi Olympics to Russia's feudalism and corruption is laid at the sort of foot of the Russian, of the Tatar yurt in some sense. It's always, everything is always blamed on the fact that Russia missed out on its sort of normal medieval development of Western Europe because it was under the, the yoke of the Tatar Mongol horde. This is actually a real book that MBA people <laughs> read. There's a strange, the only place that there's revisionism about. Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan seems to be in business circles. I don't know why, <laughs> but not in sort of proper uh, scholarly areas. Um, which is why we decided to put a, a, a double-headed eagle flag on, on the bisexual uh, flag, because in some sense we wanted to sort of ascribe a non-binary sexuality to Russia as opposed to its sort of geopolitical uh, non-binarism. Now the only um, people who, the people who benefited the most from the Tatar and Mongol horde ironically were the Orthodox Church. And why do I say ironically? Because today the Orthodox Church in Russia is most responsible for promoting a kind of nationalism, a revanchism, where we see the kind of an extreme right-wing uh, essentialism. And the reason why they were benefiting from the Tatar-Mongol horde is because it's at that period in the 11th and 12th century that the Orthodox Church became co-identified with Russian identity. Right? It's, that's when the faith became sort of became a part of a national ideology, which then led all the way to um, Nikolai and the Tsars, Romanov's uh, idea of autocracy, orthodoxy, and patriarchy. And the, the great thing about this, the, kind of the, the irony of this goes further, is that the, the Mongols and the Tatars had a, had a, pro, a relatively well-developed idea of religious tolerance. 
you were allowed to administer to the faithful, whether you were Jewish or Muslim, as long as you prayed for the health of the Han. So you had this situation where Orthodox patriarchs are in one breath praising the Han in public, but in private are cursing the Hans at the same time and using them as a kind of foil. And this kind of, um, this led to what's, what's considered to be a kind of illegitimate whiteness, if you think about Russia's relationship to its own identity and how Russians are viewed. And I'll read actually just an excerpt from Claude McKay, one of the important uh, founders or, or sort of key figures of the Harlem Renaissance, who wrote that he wrote about an episode of a friend of his called Tchaikovsky. And he says that Tchaikovsky was sent to England as correspondent of a newspaper in Odessa. But in London, he was more given to poetic dreaming and studying English literature in the British Museum, and he rarely sent any news home. So he lost his job and had to find cheap furnished rooms. A few weeks later, after he had taken up his residence in new quarters, a black guest arrived, an American gentleman of the cloth, a preacher. This preacher procured a room on the top floor and used the dining and sitting room with the other guests, among whom was a white American family. The latter protested the presence of the Negro in the house and especially in the guest room. The landlady was in a dilemma. She could not lose her American borders and the clergyman's money was not to be despised. At last she compromised by getting the white Americans to agree to the Negroes staying, staying but without being allowed the privilege of the guest room. And Tchaikovsky was asked to tell the Negro the news. Tchaikovsky strode upstairs to give the unpleasant facts to the preacher and to offer a little consolation. But the black man was not unduly offended. The white guests have the right to object to me, he explained, anticipating Garvey. They belong to a superior race. But, said Tchaikovsky, I do not object to you. I don't feel any difference. We don't understand color prejudice in Russia. Well, philosophized the preacher, you are very kind. But taking the scriptures as authority, I don't consider the Russians to be the white race. Now, this is, of course, has led this, this idea that it, it, of course, stems also from, Her from Herder and from Hegel that somehow Russians and Africans are non-historic people, that they're not inscribed in this sort of genealogy of progress and social order, and that due to biological defects that are brought about by climate, that blacks and Russians somehow were not, uh, con their, their culture, they were not conduced to sort of superior culture. Now, this is how Hegel and, and Herder have sort of developed this idea. And it, lead of, it led, of course, to much more grotesque and disastrous things like the idea of a subhuman race, the Untermenschen, which the Germans reserved for the Slavs. As you might know, Hitler was particularly uh, believed that the Slavs were a, an inferior race. And in fact, there were, I, there were theories as to why Russians were, for example, very good ballerinas was because they were mongrels of some sort. They had mixed Asian and African blood in terms of their body formation physiology, and yet they were white. So he had to kind of explain why Russians, despite outward appearance, were not an Aryan race. Now, the mo one of the most important, of course, uh, elements of this, of this question is the notion of slavery. And before we get to that, it's just a, a coincidence. There's a lot of uh, spurious theories as to why Slavs are called Slavs. If you've heard that it has to do with the fact that Slavs were slaves of, of Romans, it's actually it's too easy. That's not at all the case. It actually has to do with the word Slava, which means glory, or Slov, which means uh, word in most Slavic languages. Now, the key text, of course, of, of the idea of, of an Atlanticist, black Atlanticist ident identity is Paul Gilroy's book here. And in Paul Gilroy's book, um, the thesis is that there is no, it's not just a British black culture, a Caribbean black culture, an American black culture, but actually an Atlanticist black culture, which is far more cosmopolitan than any of its sort of uh, individual parts could, could contain. And Russia, again, had slavery, but Russia's slavery was never race-based. Russia's slaves were white. Russia enslaved its own people, and Russia's slavery was class-based. And when the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 occurred in the United States, just two years earlier was the Emancipation Reform of 1861, freeing um, Russian serfs or slaves. If, if you're familiar with 19th century Russian literature, you know that Russians um, define their wealth by the number of souls, or the number of serfs that they possessed, right? And so this, 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 element, this fact that it was not a race-based slavery was important also in, in, in the Russians' relationship to um, black communities, both living in Russia, the Russian Empire at the time, on the South Coast, um, but also those who came from the United States. 
Now, Lenin and, the na and Lenin and the nationalities question was an important one because Lenin believed that basically he had to thread the needle after the Bolshevik Revolution is how to give, how to allow for cultures that are not nations to have a sense of self-determination. Self so how to let the Dagestanis, the Abkhaz, the, Russia, the, the Soviets in, um, inherited several ethnicities. Russia has always been a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional country or empire, depending on the period in history. And this question was how to allow these cultures to have a self-determination and yet so to pr promote a certain form of nationalism, but at the same time, not so much nationalism that it, that it gets in the way of a kind of internationalism or a transnational solidarity of disenfranchised people, a class-based solidarity. Now, I mentioned this kind of, this idea of doing the splits of speaking of two things that are disparate, mutually exclusive, antithetical in one voice, in one page, in one space. We call it the metaphysical splits, which is not the splits of the legs, but the splits of the mind. So how can we wrap our two lobes around things we don't normally put together in the same brain? Um, in English, the terms for this are amphiboly. This is a very interesting one. Coincidenti oppositorum is actually a Catholic idea or Christian idea that to describe the transcendent, you have to use non-rational language. So uh, because it's, it's la language of, of this world is not able to kind of convey it. But as Victoria mentioned, even in our bio, we have these two walls that you normally don't put together, right? They're very anachronistic walls. What does the Great Wall of China have to do with the former Berlin Wall? Um, and with these walls come two geopolitical narratives that we've been obsessed with, one of which is communism, and the other one is political Islam, because those are the narratives of our region. And today, it's become kind of consensu consensus to, to understand that political Islam is to the 20, late 20th and 21st century what communism was to the 20th century, meaning it's the, the successor major ideology that defines, against which sort of liberal democracy is defining itself. Now normally you don't put Marx and Mohammed in the same sentence, in the same slide, especially if you don't want Molotov cocktails thrown through your window. I, I, I like to describe um, Marx as an abusive spouse because he's the kind of darling of the left, and we keep coming back to Marx, kind of expecting he'll be good with us this time, but it never actually gets better. We just can't make that clean break. <laughs> and, and Muhammad, this is actually not Muhammad, but the Muslims in the room will know that, because you can't show. Well, you can't show Muhammad, depending on what kind of Muslim you are, but anyway, so this is, uh, and Muhammad is considered to be kind of the shushu, a darling of the right, which also is not so straightforward. It's, he can be equally a, a leftist icon as he can be a right-wing one. Now, we've been putting these two people or two ideologies together for a while now, for almost a decade. But um, others have been doing it before us, including people like Olivier Roy in France, who talks about uh, not, that we should actually not be using the phrase the radicalization of Islam, but we should be talking about the Islamization of radicalism, meaning that in the 70s or 60s, if, if disenfranchised youth in the banlieue of Paris were upset or working against the system, they would become Trotskyists. Well, today the, the, the collapse of the left has left nothing, has left nothing with us. So that the, the one of the few avenues of for this kind of disenfranchised youth is radicalized Islam in some sense. But more importantly, or more interestingly, is this gentleman here, Norman Brown, who also talks about. If, you, if you're familiar with Norman Brown, he's a he was a professor of comparative literature at University of California, Santa Cruz, and he devoted he became a kind of mainstream or somewhat mainstream, a kind of New Yorker. London Review of Books type crossover success from, uh, from comparative literature. And he psychoanalyzed the whole of history. And in the last 10 years of his life, he decides to read the Quran as a type of proto-modernist text. He says that we didn't understand the Quran until it was, until Finnegan's Wake appeared, because we didn't understand the tools of modernist literature. Meaning, if you compare the Quran with the New and Old Testament, in the New and Old Testament, time is linear, in the Quran, it's cyclical. Characters in the New and Old Testament remain the same. So Jesus is always Jesus. Moses is always Mo Moses. In the Quran, you turn the page and Moses is Hagar. The next page, Hagar is Jesus. The next page, Jesus is Muhammad. So there's a kind of, a kind of a, it reminds me of that scene in uh, Lost Highway, you know, when you pull out and Bill Pullman is Baltazar Getty in some sense. But, but Norman Brown puts it best. He says, 
he compares Marxism and Islam, he calls them two old revolutionary forces, two tired old horses. But that we should not take any comfort from their failure because both Marxism and Islam agree that there shall be one world or there shall be none. Now, to come back to Russia and this idea of the Soviet Union and the idea of the nationalities question, the Soviet Union was the first multi-ethnic empire or nation that was anti-imperialistic. So it had to kind of, it again, had this, this strange balancing act was that it had to privilege the non-Russian people at its peripheries, but all while subjugating them. And that's why there's a great book, of, uh, there's a copy of it upstairs in the, in the, in the Sacco and Vedzenti reading rooms called The Affirmative Action Empire, that the Soviet Union was really the first nation to en en enact from 1920 to 1935, key years, an affirmative action to bring the non-Russian population who was considered backwards up to the level of the Russians. So there was a kind of coefficient of backwardness that was defined, and nations were, def were, were defined according to this coefficient of backwardness. And I'll just re um, read a quote by Bukharin, who is one of the members of the Politburo, and he talks about this. He says, as the former great power nations, nation, sorry, we should indulge the nationalist aspirations of the non-Russians and place ourselves in an unequal position in the sense of making still greater concessions to the national current. Only by such a policy, when we place ourselves in a position lower in comparisons with others, only by such a price can we purchase for ourselves the trust of the formerly oppressed nations. So you had this, this coefficient of backwardness, and you had this strange uh, phenomenon where nations like smaller nations, meaning um, the Tatars was considered to be a nation, the Azerbaijanis were considered to be a nation within the Soviet Union, right? Meaning that you would draw, as Stalin did, artificial borders that had nothing to do with where people were actually living, but he would draw where Uzbekistan was, Tajikistan was, and like the map I showed earlier. And each, each peoples or nations was given a national uh, identity or, or a, a, f a kind of a visual idiom, a folk custom was codified. Written languages were codified, so many, many peoples who didn't have written languages, like the Abkhaz or the Kazakhs, who were nomads until the early 20th century, were given scripts um, to codify a written language, a national literature, a national theater, which is why the idea of defining the Soviet Union as an empire is, is tricky, because it wasn't, uh, it was an empire that was anti-imperialistic in its, in its ideology. And of course, it led to the question of whether and in the third uh, communist international, the idea of whether the Negroes in America, blacks in America, constituted a nation. And it was determined that, that blacks in America did constitute a nation, and thus the policy of the black belt was promoted. And this black belt was important because it really put African Americans at the vanguard of leftist, ideology, uh, leftist politics in the United States. And it constantly kept the idea of, of, of black liberation in the newspapers, in the communist, uh, in the sort of progressive press, again, whether the United, whether the United, you know, Soviet Union, USSR, actually believed this or not, that's another question. In no, in no way, it's important to say, in no way am I arguing that the Soviet Union was a was a bene benevolent force through and through, but it did have its its symbolism and its articulation and its support of certain black intellectuals, whom we'll discuss in a, uh, shortly was very key in defining a transnational black identity that led to black internationalism later. One of these people is Claude McKay. Now Claude McKay really helped, the Soviet Union really helped Claude McKay develop a transnational consciousness and the idea that we can actually attain a collective consciousness not through a higher sense of self-consciousness, but actually through a sense of, of shared disenfranchisement, right? Now, McKay makes the ma magic pilgrimage, what he calls the magic pilgrimage, in 1919 um, or 20 to the Soviet Union, and he publishes a book there called Negroes in America. And in this book, he talks about the fact that Russians feel themselves kin in spirit to Negroes. They want to help make them, meaning black, Amer black Americans, free. And not the least of the oppressed that fill the thoughts of the new Russia are the Negroes of America and Africa. If we look back two decades to recall how the Tsarist persecution of the Russian Jews agitated democratic America, we will get some idea of the mind of liberated Russia towards the Negroes of America. 
the Russian people are reading the terrible history of their own recent past in the tragic position of the American Negro today. Now, the, I, the, there's a funny anecdote where Claude McKay, who was never a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, and in fact turns against it later on in life, is in, in the Soviet Union in 1920, and he's there with Otto Huiswood, who is the first black member, full card-carrying member of the Communist Party of the United States. And they go to, to present to Zinoviev and Bukharin, sort of senior leadership, the Troika in some sense, of, uh, of the Soviet Union, Union. And when they go to do that, actually the Soviet authorities ask McKay to speak because they, deter they, de they deem that Otto Huiswood is not black enough. So the image they have of what a black American should be is Claude McKay. Of course, neither of these were originally born in this, neither of Claude, neither McKay nor Huisford were born in the United States, who were both from the Caribbean, but they actually gave an audience to Claude McKay as opposed to Huisford. Now, this idea of linguistic interracialism is an important one for us because we're obsessed with language politics, with translation as a form of linguistic hospitality. And there's an incredible phenomenon in the fact that two of Claude McKay's most political texts, Negroes in America and Trial by Lynching, were translated partly by Claude McKay himself into Russian with the help of a translator, but the original English was lost. So today, when you want to sort of consult these texts, as we see here, it says Negroes in America by Claude McKay, translated by Roger, Robert J. Winter. So they've been back translated into English. And the same with trial by lynching. And Claude McKay actually talks about the fact that linguistic interracialism is akin to reproductive interracialism, meaning that it's challenging the fact that there is a pure source through which authentic black history or the black body should be conveyed, that can be conveyed through other languages or Creole languages or syncretic languages as much as in English or in French. <laughs> Дорогой Поль Робсон, через горы и реки, через океан шлют вам сердечный привет, советские люди. Among these was Paul Robeson, who was a, really a rock star in, uh, in the Soviet Union and was, um, came, when he landed in the Soviet Union for the first time, um, to visit on, on commission by Sergei Eisenstein to film, uh, uh, to shoot a film about the Haitian Revolution, which never came to, to be. He said that he actually felt like a, f like a free man for the first time when he actually landed in Moscow. And there's a summit in Kazakhstan today, a peak of a mountain called Vershina Robson, which is uh, named after Paul Robson today. Now, the most interesting story of this, of this magic pilgrimage is the story of 20-odd African Americans who were invited by the Soviet Union in 1922 to come to Moscow to shoot a film called Black and White. Very, very straightforward title. You can imagine it's a propaganda film that the Soviet Union wants to shoot to, um, to address the racial inequalities and racism in the United States. And this film is never made because, for many reasons, but the, m the primary reason is that the Soviet Union desperately wants recognition, official recognition, from the United States at the time because the Soviet Union is consolidate, has consolidated the revolution. It's 1922. And they want to start the, the Novy Ekonomichki Plan, the NEP, which is Stalin's five-year plan to industrialize Russia, Soviet Union, and sort of and jumpstart it by kind of tweaks of capitalism, barely sort of drizzles, as we talk about balsamic vinegar today, drizzles of capitalism, let's say, on the Soviet project. And, uh, and so the film is abandoned. The, most of the African Americans who are invited are either sent back home, expenses paid, of course, or some of them go back to Paris, some to Berlin. But a group of them decide, and they're all invi they're invited by Louis Thompson Patterson, who is an important professor of, uh, of sociology in the United States, and married to William Patterson, one of the leading um, lawyers of the Communist Party, who in fact 
represented Sacco and Vanzetti, after whom the reading rooms upstairs are named. Um, and they decide, so a small group of them, Langs and Hughes amongst them, here in the, here in the center, Langs and Hughes and about five or six others decide, they, the Soviet Union says, you can go anywhere you want. We'll, uh, we'll, all expenses paid, we'll take care of it. So they, decide, they say, okay, let's go south. Let's go to your south. So they decide to go to Central Asia to see other dark-skinned people who are picking cotton, who remind them of, of course, not only the United States black belt, but here the Central Asians have been newly liberated. So they're no longer under the imperial rule of white Russians, but actually sort of empowered themselves. Not as private property owners, but let's say uh, they are in charge of their own districts pol in political sort of uh, organizations. So they head to, to Tashkent through Turkmenistan. They go south. And this, of course, it becomes even more interesting economically because there are, there are, theories, there are theories that Russia first, Russia was pushing in the same way the United States has this kind of manifest destiny of pushing from coast to coast or from sea to shining sea, westward, let's say. The Soviet Union, or Russia, actually, was pushing eastwards towards also the Atlantic, sorry, the Pacific, but from the um, other perspective, so eastwards towards, towards uh, Asia and south towards the Caucasus and, and Central Asia. But the last push actually happens to take over the Emirate of Bukhara, and many, many economists believe that this happened because of the jump in the price of cotton following the, the, the Civil War. That the, because of the majority of cotton, the cotton index was disturbed by the Civil War, that they actually, the Russians decided to sort of take over the, the Bukharan Emirate and, and conduct their own cotton production. And this cotton production happens, of course, by the time Langston Hughes comes, it's not just cotton which is being picked, and not just uh, Central Asians who are being liberated, but women are being liberated as well. They're asked, of course, to take off the veil. And I'd like to talk about the idea of intersectionality, intersectionalist, or how we can understand questions of gender, sexuality, and race through this trip to Central Asia of Langston and Hughes. When Langston Hughes goes down to Central Asia, he witnesses a, perf a performance called Bachibozi. And I'll just play you a clip here. <laughs> writes how he pays for his, uh, his trip through Asia after the, the sort of hospitality of the Soviets is he continues through Asia and he pays for his voyages by writing articles for the U United States press for all kinds of different outfits or media outlets, including a women's magazine whose title is escaping me, but it's, it's a white woman's magazine in some sense. And he writes about this phenomenon of Bachibazi. None of the younger members of the present theater Soviet-educated boys and girls would speak of this particular phase of old native life. Even those men who once were boy dancers would, speak of, would not speak of it. They knew it was something visitors from the West might not approve or understand. From the four corners of Uzbekistan, all the boy dancers who were free and could travel would come to perform. They would put on their wigs with the girlish curls, their silken robes, and bright boots. Then each in turn would begin to circle to the music in the vast outdoor space recreating in his own way the pattern movements, the delicate turnings of the head and wrists that characterize the Uzbek dance. The huge male audience would shout their approval as each especially beautiful traditional movement revealed itself anew, expertly developed by the boy in the dusty ring. About these dancers, there was nothing vulgar or uncouth. They were ancient gesture rhythms and plastic pantomimes, molded into tra traditional patterns, handed down by generations of dance makers out of the past. <laughs> 
the spectators knew many of the movements by heart and loved them for their beauty. To Western eyes, nothing, to Western eyes, nothing would have seemed unduly strange, except that the dancers with their long curls, smiling and beckoning with their eyes, were boys, not girls. When Langston Hughes arrives in 1922 and sees this dance, he's seen the last remnants of this dance because women have been liberated. And what does that mean, women have been liberated? It means that women can dance in public. The reason why boys were dancing historically in, in Central Asia, and today still, I think the only place in the world it still occurs is in Afghanistan, was because women were not or are not allowed to dance in public. So this veil is removed, and he's, of course, like Claude McKay, they both squarely place the idea of women's liberation in the struggle for black uh, rights and equality, that they see this through an intersectional perspective, but at the same time, Hughes ruse the passing of this pre-modern age as a gay black man whose sexuality is not out. Uh, he understands the complexity of the situation. Why? Well, because he, he understands that when the Soviets liberate women, they also desexualize the pu this public space. For the Soviet ideal of, of woman, ideal woman was masculine, masculinized. Because for a woman to be masculinized meant that she would be capable, she would have authority, and that she would profess values to kind of a modern notion of the revolution, which was in some sense a Russian notion of the revolution. Very much the kind of the, 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 the asexual worker in some sense. So one of the women that he, he spends time with is Tamara Hanum, whom he describes as neither female nor male. And he says, he kind of gives a nice little aside. He says, if Gertrude Bell had been, Gertrude, if Gertrude Stein had been there, a bell would have rang. And, uh, and, and, he, and Tamara Hanum is, a, is an Armenian, ethnic Armenian living in Uzbekistan who becomes one of the most famous dancers at the time, taking the place of the boys. But he gives a sort of sly uh, critique as well. And he talks about how she doesn't know all the moves. She never actually masters all the moves that the boys have mastered. Now, he visits with Arthur Kussler, uh, a, 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 a kind of a young German Marxist who later turns into be one of the most anti-Marxist, more anti-Marxist intellectuals, anti-communist intellectuals. And, um, and this, uh, another example of the dance here, as you can see it here, it's a bit dark. he does is he forges a kind of solidarity between blacks and Central Asians, built not on race or class, class identity, but on a common struggle for queer visibility. And he couches this queer visibility and gender cross-representation within larger questions of social reform and progress, and very much in a revolution that's insisting on its incompatibility, right? Because for the Soviet Union, femininity was considered to be Asian. Right? That, that somehow any kind of homosexual representation or any kind of effeminate man was considered to be an Eastern or Asian man. Um, and this is something that is something that we will pursue in, in, in years to come, I'm sure, is that we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of contrarians in the sense that I believe that wherever there's consensus, that's exactly where you have to go and find the opposite. Today there's a consensus that somehow Islam is more homophobic than Christianity and Judaism, whether it's pinkwashing of, of, of Israeli politics or just a kind of a, a liberal disdain or ignorance of, of history of the, of the Middle East. But it's actually, there's a great, uh, great article about this called Autoerotica, nice little pun, um, about the fact that, that Muslim cultures, whether it was the Ottoman cultures, whether it was Persian culture, was actually quite homoerotic and, and non-binary in the sense that, and only became homophobic when they came into contact with the colonial powers. When the British and the French arrive in, 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 in Iran in the 17th century, 18th century, and they start making fun of the Iranians because in Iran, or in Persia at the time, there was three hierarchies of beauty, right? There's a, a man, a woman, and the highest form of beauty was a young boy, or young man. Not a young boy, but a young man. Very much like you find in, the Greek, in, Greek, in ancient Greece. Or Ottomans, for example, didn't have notions of straight or gay, or bisexual, what they had was notions of people who are either penetrators or penetrated. So it's a different way of understanding um, sexuality. Or, or Finally, there's a question of language, again, that we'll come back to uh, over and over again, which is that if we understand this non-anglophone, non non-francophone idiom, idiom, it'd be good to look at somebody like 
Du Bois through the perspective of Bakhtin. Bakhtin, as you might know, is a theorist of the carnival, but Bakhtin also is somebody who talks about this double voice that we have, that, that the double voice is not just one linked to race, but it's actually one that goes to, to an original linguistic question. And, uh, and Bakhtin's quote is, language for the individual consciousness lies on the borderline between oneself and the other. The word and language is half someone else's. It becomes one's own only when the speaker populates it with his own intention, his own accent, when he appropriates the word, adapting it to his own semantic and expressive intention. Prior to this moment of appropriation, the word does not exist in a neutral or impersonal language. It is not, after all, out of a dictionary that the speaker gets his words, but rather it exists in other people's mouths. It's a really beautiful idea. The words exist in other people's mouths, in other people's contexts, serving other people's intentions. It is from here that one must take the word and make it one's own. Now, Henry Louis Gates Jr. talks about this idea of sign the, sign the, the signifying monkey, right? From, an, uh, from African folklore, that there's a, a kind of metaphoric literacy that, we're speak that, there's, that blacks have had to speak one way within the earshot of white culture, again, kind of uh, a more nuanced reading of this double, uh, double consciousness that the W.B. W. B. Du Bois mentions. Now, if there's this signifying monkey, then it's also important to mention the father of Russian literature, whose name is Alexander Pushkin. What Pushkin did, and there's, there's a lot of debates over understanding Pushkin as a, as a black Russian, but, it's, but he was one-eighth African. His, his great-grandfather, yeah, his great-grandfather was Abraham Hannibal, Ganibal in Russian, who was a, as a boy of seven, captured by the Ottomans and, and made into a slave and then gifted to Peter the Great. And Peter the Great immediately freed him, educated him, freed him, and he became an envoy, or, uh, a political envoy of Peter the Great, and actually spent m much time in France. Voltaire called him the dark star of the Enlightenment, which is um, a strange way to talk about Hannibal. But, um, but he conversed with Montesquieu and others, and this idea of Pushkin being black is, of course, been played up and down according to who's doing it. But it's important to understand that he was the founder of modern Russian literature. Until Pushkin, Russians wrote in French, and he was the first person to take Russian, which was considered to be a vernacular, low idiom, and elevate it to a poetic language. And Henry Louis Gates Jr. himself talks about this, is that he says, imagine how Jefferson would have treated Pushkin, right? Imagine if Pushkin had been born in the United States. According to the one drop rule, not only would Pushkin not have ever been educated, but he definitely wouldn't have become the father of a literature, a national literature. And this, of course, is proven by the fact that in the Harlem Liberator in 1933, if you got a subscription to the Harlem Liberator, you would receive a Pushkin bust in every Negro home. So Pushkin as a, as a, as a, as a black icon is, is, is an interesting um, notion of sort of expatriation also, of this idea of, this, of, of the faculty of substitution is understanding one thing through another, understanding one's own self-consciousness through others' consciousnesses. And this comes, comes back to this question of a very a Muslim tenant. It's actually a hadith of the Prophet. Because of Muhammad's being exiled from um, Mecca to Medina, there's a Prophet that says, Islam began in exile and will be in exile again. Blessed are those who exile themselves. Now, for me, who was a pretty atheist person uh, until I was 30 or so and still um, questioning some of these notions, I have to say that there's something very important in this and that it challenges both the Western insistence in psychology or even the Enlightenment idea, not only of direct uh, report of investigation, but also in psychology how to understand oneself, we're told we have to look deep within ourselves, right? That we have to understand who we are, what we want to be, who we want to be. And this idea of expatriation is the opposite, is that to understand oneself, one has to go very, very, very far away from oneself. To maybe understand notions of black internationalism, one shouldn't only look at it from an Anglophone perspective or an American perspective, but actually should look at it from a Russian perspective where there's historically been very few black people actually living. And this idea of belatedness, it goes on and on. You, there's all, the, all kinds of interesting parallels that I recommend you read upstairs. And a particular book called, by Dale Peterson called Up From Bondage, 
where he compares, at given moments, the relationship between the Russian soul, which is a very important idea in Russian literature, the dusha, and the African-American soul. And one of these moments is, one of these sort of similarities is the fact that both Russians and, and African-Americans are considered to be behind Western white literature by African-Americans themselves, from, Alan, uh, from people like Crummel or Eurasianist and Chadaev, for example, Russian intellectuals like Chadaev, but also Eurasianists. But he talks about the idea that belatedness can become a kind of beatitude. That in fact, there's a, there's a kind of a providential understanding to African Americans and Russians being behind, that they are the ones who usher in a, pro, uh, a kind of a utopia of some sorts. Now, if we understand this also, is that foreign, the foreigner in, in American discourse or the immigrant is often ascribed with these two types of temporalities, right? We think of the foreigner, the immigrant, as somehow representing the past because they come from somewhere a little bit less advanced, whether they're Mexican-Americans, Iranian-Americans, Somali-Americans, and yet these immigrants are also endowed with a kind of future forward thinking because they are representing the vanguard of where the United States is going. So they're both supposed to be in the past and in the future, or leading toward the future. And this is, of course, a temporal position or a kind of a a position we call the anti-modernist position, and we ascribe it to a gentleman whose name is Mola Nasruddin, who is the topic of another entire lecture performance about satire in the Middle East. But Mola Nasruddin is a, is, a, is a kind of Muslim equivalent of La Fontaine's fables or the Brothers Grimm's, uh, in the sense that parents tell children stories of, of Nasruddin to impart uh, lessons of morality and perspective that are seemingly s simple, but actually quite complex. So a typical Mullah Nasruddin story is, he's a kind of wise fool, and he, you find him everywhere Muslims lived, historically, from Croatia to China, sort of e all the way to China, down to Somalia and Sudan, in different iterations. Kind of trickster, wise fool. And my favorite Nasruddin story is, Mullah Nasruddin is on one side of the river, and he yells, and somebody yells to him, Mullah Nasruddin, how do I get to the other side of the river? And he yells, you are on the other side of the river. So like a, through a very, very simple, stupid perspective, unraveling much more complex things. A kind of proto Ali G or Borat, in some sense, right? Asking very simple, stupid questions to smart subject matter. Now I'll end with just uh, one of the, the sort of thoughts that comes from this idea of looking at black identity through Russia. It start, we start to question the positions that were that we take for granted in the United States, one of which is multiculturalism. There's a lot of debate today in Europe, where I live in Berlin, um, about the failures of multiculturalism. It's considered to be a kind of a right-wing talking point, a populist talking point, that multiculturalism has failed. I don't agree that it's failed, but I do agree that it's, there's a problem with the fact that we assume that the way we integrate minorities has to be through multiculturalism. Because the Soviets had another idea, which was called multinationalness, meaning that Separate, separate nationalities, these nationalities we spoke about earlier, each had their own form of self-determination, but they weren't asked or, or, or required to mix to become one whole, but that they were allowed to coexist. And if you look at even periods of medieval history, for example, when we talk about Muslims and Christians and Jews getting along in Andalusia or 14th century Aragon, for example, there's always this idea that somehow coexistence and conviviality means harmony. But that's actually much, that's not really the case. If you look at Vilnius in the 17th, 18th century, you had a Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian, Unionite, Un Uniate Orthodox, Catholic, Jewish, Tatars. And actually, there were avenues for this conflict or low level violence to come out, but there was never this idea of harmony uh, in some sense. And this, in some sense, you understand to what extent multiculturalism really is a kind of neoliberal idea that we've just, we've inherited because it's been the victorious economic system, but that there was another um, approach to, to uh, multi-confessional and multi-ethnic nations that, was, uh, that offered a different way out. Um, I'd like to thank you for your patience. I'd like to thank uh, C.R. Majani also for this uh, incredible exhibition upstairs that allowed us to develop these ideas further and, um, and to the curatorial team for inviting us. Good night.